everyone, welcome back to Fixing the Future, our weekly live appointment to explore a future-focused education together with some of the most uh, inspiring experts of the world. Today, Atlas of the Future will introduce you to uh, Xavier Prats Monnet, uh, anthropologist by training but whose main passion is education. Uh, formerly a high-ranking official at the European Commission, today Xavier is a special advisor at Teach for All, a global non-profit organization aiming at uh, expanding the uh, educational opportunities worldwide. In today's session, uh, Xavier will be in a conversation with uh, Pastora Martinez Santer, Vice President for Globalization and Cooperation at the UOC, Un Universitat Oberta de Catalunya. And they will be talking about the future of higher education. Do you um, have any questions about that or would you like to propose an idea? Please let us uh, hear your voice by using the chat box. Pastora will take care of collecting the questions and bring them into the conversation. Everything clear? Everyone ready? Let's go. Welcome, Pastora. Thank you very much, Silvia, and thanks to Atlas of the Future for inviting me to participate in this very interesting series of conversations concerning uh, education. Uh, thank you also to the audience that has listened to us from all over the world. It's a great pleasure for me being here today with Xavier prats -Munet. Xavier, Xavier is one of the brilliant minds thinking about educational policies and practices, and in particular concerning higher education systems. As, as Silvia mentioned, uh, Xavier is currently a special advisor of Teach for All, and he's also senior advisor at the Open University of Catalonia, the, the WOC, my university, so we are very lucky for that. Xavier's professional career has been tied to the European Commission, uh, where he, he served uh, in several positions, including as Director General for Education and Culture, where his main responsibilities were the modernization of European education and training systems, educational mobilities, including the Erasmus program, and international relations in the field of education, culture, and, and job. Good afternoon, Xavier. Thank you very much for being here today with us. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, good morning to some of you. It's a pleasure to be yeah, here with you, too. Pastora. <laughs> and, uh, Thank you, Xavier. It's, it's a pleasure to be with the after the future community, you know, this community is based on a simple idea that uh, unless we believe that the future can be better, we won't have the strength to make it a better future. So it's really great to be here and to have this conversation with you all. So thank you for having me here. Thank you, Xavier. As, as you said, we're going to talk about the future of higher education. But before we come to the future, let me start with a question about the past. So in your opinion, uh, have universities really changed since they were invented? What do you think? Well, yeah, I mean, it's actually good to start looking at the past before thinking of the future. And I think the short answer to the question is, of course, yes. I mean, no human invention could exist for 900 years without changing, if only because societies change so much. So, yes, I mean, universities were born when urban life started in Europe. Uh, uh, the first university was Bologna, started in 10, year 1088, followed immediately by Oxford, Paris, Salamanca, and so many others, mostly in southern and western Europe. So that was a really European invention, but it was another world. I mean, actually, the first universities were not even buildings. They were associations, guilds of scholars who had privilege as a community and who actually had the monopoly 
of teaching and the capacity to provide a degree. So if that sounds vaguely familiar and similar to what universities do today, give degrees, it's because it was similar. But again, it was a different world. I mean, look, Bologna, for example, uh, students started usually going to Bologna at the age of 30 or so, and they actually paid their teachers to learn. Uh, that's how the university was funded. Paris was funded by the church. Uh, the Oxford University was funded by the crown, by the state. But above all, it was a different world because the purpose of universities at that time and the purpose of what today we would call the intellectuals of the time was not to discover new things, was not to explore the world or to innovate. It was to reveal the hand of God in everything. Now, that is a big challenge. But it's also not perhaps a great incentive for innovation and for change. But then came humanism and the scientific revolution and an explosion of interest in knowledge, an explosion of optimism about man being the center of the universe, not God. And maybe even more importantly, the idea of the empowerment of the individual through knowledge. This is what led Leonardo da Vinci to dissect the wing of a bird and then the corpse of a human being to build a flying machine or, uh, or Galileo to build a rudimentary telescope to try to imagine the shape of the universe. So this strength of you know, eagerness to know about the world and about people is what gave rise to so many universities and actually has been driving university in higher education since then, actually until 1810. I mean, 1810 is when Humboldt University was created. And even today, until today, most universities would see themselves as a reflection of that time. Uh, a university being a place of intellectual freedom, uh, a place where you combine research and education, and a place where different disciplines are measured towards LN excellence by their peers. So imagine that Galileo or, or Isaac Newton or Charles Darwin actually came to visit their old universities today. Would they be surprised? I mean, this is really different. Well, I think they would be surprised by two main things. The first is numbers, just numbers. So many people study. I mean, even you know, not 300 years ago, just 50 years ago, only 10% of young people in Europe actually went to university after school, only 10%. Today, 40%. In some countries like Spain, even more, 45%. So a massive increase of people as opposed to what happened just 50 years ago when only the children of middle class families who could afford not to be in the labor market after school went to university. So that's the first surprising thing for any debt uh, uh, eminence. But then the second change, which you know, would be extremely shocking is women. So many women learning, teaching, conducting research. I mean, that's unthinkable. I mean, Darwin died in 1882, I think. At that time, 70%, 70% of European women could not read or write. Today, 70% of the students of medicine in Spanish universities are women. It's just incredible, incredible. I mean, you know, Darwin, when he was about 30, must have been 1840 or so, he was about to marry his cousin. So he wrote a list, he was a very methodic man, and maybe the human being that has most transformed the way we think, the most innovative mind in the history of humanity. So he wrote this list, the pros and cons of marriage. On the pro side, well, you have a companion for life, better than a dog. That's what he said. On the cons, well, a bit boring, and you know, not so many visits to intelligent discussions at men's clubs. This is how a great mind, a great innovator like Darwin saw women at the time. So he would be profoundly shocked. And universities have changed on that too. I mean, Oxford did eliminate the quota, limiting the number of women who could enter the university. It's just that they did it in 1957. So it took them 800 years. But, you know, there's been a lot of progress. So yes, universities have changed a lot. They have changed with the time, they have changed with mentality, 
but not so quickly. And one thing I wanted to say to, to conclude, sorry for being so long, uh, Pastora. One thing I want to say, the one thing that has characterized universities, at least for the last three centuries, is that they have the monopoly of the creation of knowledge, of the distribution of knowledge, and of the certification of knowledge, like those people in Bologna 900 years ago. This has not changed until now. So the question is, will it change now in the future? That's a, a very good question, uh, Xavier, a question that is um, yeah, all around in the discussions we are having right now in different international forums. But keeping this idea in mind, um, let's move to the present. Uh, and we will go to the future uh, uh, later on. So um, now in the present, um, how do you think is the global university landscape changing today, right now? Yeah, well, the short answer is that I think there's a really a, a radical change huh? because, you know, I mean, well, there is a pandemic and as you know, that has shattered really many assumptions. I mean, few universities, few countries, few institutions were prepared in healthcare as in education, uh, lack of human resources, uh, problem of technology, access to technology, when online education became an obligation, a problem of lack of infrastructure, uh, lack of training for educators who cannot do everything just like that. So that has been really a major shakeup that will oblige us to think about the future of education, of course. I mean, Cambridge, as you were saying in the past, has not has been teaching online throughout this year. So it's, you know, that's a real, a real cataclysmic change. But I think that there are three, three even more important and long term trends in higher education, in the higher education landscape. The first is that the thirst, the hunger for knowledge in our societies has no end. So we will see a dramatic increase in the demand for education, uh, a demand for new skills, for more skills, for more university education. Look, I think the most credible forecasts foresee that between now and 2030, in 10 years, over the course of 10 years, every day, every day, 40,000 new young people will enter university. So a massive increase in the need for knowledge, which I don't know whether it is it will be similar to what we have seen with the Enlightenment, with the scientific revolution. But now, scientific advancement and the importance of knowledge in the knowledge society will dramatically increase the demand for education. And the important thing for universities, as we know them now, is that there's no way, there's no way that this increase in demand can be met by the universities as we know them now with the resources that they have now. So that's the first, I think, trend. The second one is a, a major change in the distribution of talent worldwide. I mean, look at it this way. Think about the population of the world of young people with a university degree. So people from the age of 25 to the age of 35 who have a university degree, where are they? So in the year 2000, just exactly 20 years ago, more or less 15% were in Europe, 15, 17% were in the US, and 15, 17% were in China. That's how it was distributed. 3% of those people, the 25 to 35 with the US degree, 3% in the world were in Spain, 10% in Japan. What about today, 20 years later? Well, a third of them, 33% are in China, 10% in Europe, 10% in the US, 4%, not 10, in Japan because of demographic aging. 1%, not 3% in Spain. So as you can see, a massive trend of change in how the talent is distributed in the world. Another example, China. There are as many foreign students in China last year as in the UK, half a million. And look at it yet, another example in Europe. In Europe, there's many degrees being offered by many universities modern universities. The number of degrees that are being taught in English by continental European universities has increased 50 times in the last 10 years. 
What does this tell you? It tells you that university education, higher education, is becoming a global phenomenon across the world with increasing emergence of emerging economies, growing economies, China, India, as major contributors to the world talent. And now, let me come to the third trend, the third trend in the landscape, which I think is perhaps the most important one. I think that the pandemic has given us, I think, a sharp reminder of the potential of universities of higher education to address the crisis, the challenges, the big you know, problems of our societies, from environment to social issues to healthcare. Look at the COVID-19. I mean, can you believe this? In less than a year, we'll have from scratch almost two, three, five, seven vaccines. How is this possible? This is a major feat of humanity. I mean, of course, we are in such a crisis, economic and health crisis, that even a month delay seems very long. But if you think about what it means for humanity to be able to challenge this virus in just a year, this can only be possible with the huge advances of technology, but also with an unprecedented degree of cooperation between higher education institutions. And I think actually, no, I hope that this is a sign of what will be the future of universities in terms of networks cooperation and involvement of universities with our challenges for the future. Thank you, Xavier. In, um, uh, in, in 2015, um, a, a new international political agenda was approved uh, in the United Nations, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, that for the first time um, said that higher education was key in order to solve these global challenges, global and local challenges that we are facing right now that you were mentioning. So um, five years ago, uh, all the member states at the UN decided to put higher education in the agenda in order to move forward also to, to, to make all these uh, advancements. But then, as you mentioned, uh, COVID-19 arrived, this pandemic uh, that we are suffering right now. And one of the effects of the pandemic that we've seen, sometimes we've enjoyed and sometimes we've suffered, has been the eruptions of many and different technologies in our daily life, right? Um, and we've heard a lot about digitalization in our society, in different sectors, and also in education. So in that sense, what do you think it would be the real impact of technology in higher education? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the short answer is that we are looking at a tsunami in education. But this is actually a very, a very controversial question. I mean, the issue of the impact of technology in education is a very old one. In a century ago, in 1913, Thomas Edison said that uh, in 10 years, books would disappear from schools because the cinema would be able to teach anything better than a book. Now, of course, he was the one who invented the cinema, but, but still that was the beginning of a long discussion as to how technology will affect education. And there are many, many skeptics even today, because, you know, as we said, you know, universities have remained pretty stable for many, many, many years. So if they have survived through centuries, why not survive also with this, uh, 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 you know, introduction of technology in our societies? Well, I think that the pandemic has settled that discussion and technology is here to stay, but, you know, more importantly than that, I think that there is a, a, a much bigger phenomenon because due mainly to technology, universities have actually lost the monopoly of the creation of knowledge, of the transmission of knowledge, and of the certification of knowledge, which are the three characteristics that have determined the essence of higher education institutions and their justification for existence uh, for at least the last three centuries. You know, look back at, you know, when the walk, the Open University of Catalonia was created 25 years ago, you know, no Wikipedia, no Google, 
no Coursera or EVX. So that was, you know, a big intuition by those who created the work to realize that technology would have an enormous impact on us. Because, you know, before Wikipedia, the only source of knowledge was the professor. Before Coursera, the only way to distribute knowledge was the university. And for Google, and before Coursera, the only way to certify knowledge was through a public administration decree sealed by a university. And this has, you know, I think, dramatically changed. And for the last 25 years, all our lives have been invaded by digitalization. Uh, smartphones, internet, uh, of course, I and mean, you know this very well. And yet, the one aspect of our life which was immune to this change and sometimes indifferent to this change has been, in many cases, education. And I think that this has, has finished. And this is, on the one hand, a source of great opportunities because, you know, thanks to technology, we can think of a far broader range of people we can reach with education. We can make education more personally adapted to people's needs. We can so broaden the modules of what we teach. So we can really, really have be much more inclusive in education and increase access dramatically. But at the same time, as everybody knows, there's also a risk. Usually people speak about the risk in terms of privacy. But let me tell you of one thing that for me is a big challenge that universities will not and should not ignore in the future. And this is the risk that technology brings of determinism. Let me explain. I mean, now a computer knows you so well. I mean, you read an e-book and the, the e-book actually can know you more than you know the book. You can personalize education so much that you have the risk that people will be, will, will take away the liberty of improving. You can have a university that decides who they recruit based on a very accurate algorithm of how much people will deliver in the future. So we have a number of challenges that are completely new, that are the consequence of technology entering our life and now education, and we will have to face them. And I think that it is really in our hands, in those who believe that the assets of the future that we can have a better future if we work on it to make sure that what technology represents for education is not exclusion, is not inequality, but it is more inclusion and more opportunities. Yeah, thank you, Xavier. You, you were mentioning both advantages and, and risks of these technologies and probably it sounds like science fiction for, for <laughs> For many of us, but in fact, it has already happened. No? We had a reason um, concerning the risk. Eh? We have a recent example last summer in the UK that was related with these A level exams, uh, where instead of scoring actual exams, grades were determined by an algorithm, and almost 40% of the students received grades lower than they, they had anticipated. So th this was called like a big fiasco. Um, so yeah, in that sense, as you mentioned, Xavier, it's important to take into account both advantages and risks uh, when incorporating technologies to education. Uh, but as you also mentioned, technology is here to stay. Um, um, and yeah, things are, are, it seems that now things are moving and are moving faster that uh, in the previous time and the evolution you, you mentioned at the beginning. Um, so maybe for me, the, the most relevant question now here is what should be the mission of the universities now on, or at least in the 21st century? Yeah, that is really the really critical question. And I mean, on technology, I mean, you are very modest huh? because you are the one who knows about technology because this is what you and the work university does as a pioneer in digital education for the last 25 years. And you're right. I mean, technology is what we make of it. And let me give you a blunt example. We were mentioning Darwin and his little list of marriage pros and cons and Oxford allowing the thought that women have the same capacities at birth than men uh, for intellectual achievement. Well, let me remind you that just a 
couple of years ago, the University of Tokyo admitted that they had an algorithm to change the marks in the exam for entrance at their university for medicine because they just wanted to limit the number of women who could access medicine. Now, so this tells you that, you know, uh, our societies will be what we will make them and technology will not be a miracle and will not be a dreadful condemnation. It will be what we make of it. So I completely agree that this is really what is at stake. So what about the mission of universities? I mean, this is really important huh? because if, you know, if we admit, I know it's a big if, but for me, it's very clear. If we admit that the justification of universities for so many years, you know, we are the ones who have knowledge, who create it, who distribute it, who give it away, and who actually certify who knows what. If this is not just universities who can do this, if we can learn in many ways, if uh, there's so many different opportunities and actors, I mean, remember the world of education technology will be 10 trillion US dollars in 2030. So if there are so many actors, what is a university for? And here, of course, there's no simple answer, but I would say three things. Well, first of all, I think, you know, we have to give the young people of today a preparation for the life they will be living in the future, not a reminder of the life as it was in our past. And if you think about, you know, are the courses that we give, are the curricula that universities provide today really interesting? Are they really preparing young people for the future? I don't think the answer is a clear yes. So the first task I had, when you look at how universities should think about what they do in the future, is what kind of skills we should be giving. And contrary to what some people think, this is actually very clear. I mean, the difficulty of strategies for higher education is not to design a very good strategy, it's to implement it. We know that we need to give better digital skills. We know that we have to make sure that citizens become critical people who can distinguish fact from opinion. We know that we have to, most importantly, train better, give more support, modernize the teaching professions because we have all over Europe, at least, we have an, a graying generation of educators who don't always have the tools for today and for tomorrow. So the first thing to look at is, you know, how are we teaching and how could we increase teaching skills and less giving information to students? The problem that students have today is not to get more information. Actually, it's the opposite, is to distinguish the relevant information from what is accessory or what is just noise. We have so much noise in our lives in our society. So this is the first thing to look at. But then there's a second one that is, I think, more important because maybe we can look at the way we think about our higher education. And let me give you just three examples. Why focus on giving people a degree, a master's, for example? I mean, master's, we know what they are, actually. Those people, Darwin, even Galileo would know very well what the masters is. So, but do we really need to continue giving these degrees that certify knowledge that probably in many cases will be obsolete in a relatively short time? Or should we rather provide young people, people of all ages with a subscription to access to the knowledge that the university provides? Wouldn't this be perhaps a better way to give to society what universities have always been giving, which is knowledge. So secondly, why offer, just why organize universities by disciplines vertically? When we know for a fact that today knowledge is interdisciplinary, nothing that is not the most simple element of knowledge, nothing uh, can be understood in our world without an interdisciplinary approach. And we know that innovation is not interdisciplinary, it's antidisciplinary. This is the way to look at innovation. And yet we are still organizing universities, mostly vertically. And in many cases, if you just know these institutions, you realize that basically the organization of a university is a truce, is the armistice between departments. So that is the second way. And then the first thing is, you know, why suppose 
then most people should get their higher education from one institution rather than from a network of institutions, which is how universities mostly work and definitely should be working. So maybe besides looking at teaching better skills, more digital skills, being more inclusive, uh, trying to ensure that we raise critical children, rather than just look at providing degrees and maybe extend access to higher education, rather than you know just think about somebody being trained in one university. This, this could be maybe a different way of thinking of how higher education is delivered. But then I think there is more because, you know, I think as we were saying, you know, for the last two centuries at least, since 1810, universities have been defined by excellence as measured by peers. And in a way, this is, I don't know, not, not a justification, but this is perhaps a tendency not to be really part an actor in societal challenges of today. But in these times of, you know, extremely complex challenges, look at the COVID pandemic and look at the challenges of environmental uh, issues, look at climate change, look at what technology could do uh, to us. I think that we have to make sure that universities demonstrate a greater impact on society. Um, you know, even more importantly than that, uh, there is no better argument. I haven't seen any scholarly article with a better argument for multilateral cooperation for international governance than the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, it's just a shining, brutal example that the problems of our society are problems of humanity and they have to be solved by humanity itself and not by its different tribes as they are organized. Now, at the same time, what we see is a loss of trust in international institutions, in international cooperation, in multilateralism. Well, you know, in my view, the real mission of universities of the 21st century is to reestablish that trust. Since they don't have the monopoly of the transmission of information, since anybody can send anything anywhere to the world, let's make sure that universities become a sign of trust a guarantee of scientific knowledge, a guarantee that one can believe in science, that one can believe in the empowerment indeed of the individual through knowledge. This is essential. Just look at what is happening in the US now after the elections. What we have is not just an electoral contest. We have a real crisis of institutions and a real crisis of belief in what humanity can do for science. Now, if there's something that defines the atlas of the future, if there's something that will guarantee that we have a better future, it's going to be belief in science and knowledge. And I cannot think, I cannot think of a better institution to show this and to lead the way against the more discredited international institutions than the university. Now, this is a thing, a task. And I believe that, you know, a long time ago, we, found out that universities can be extremely useful to empower the individual through knowledge. But now we know that they can do more than that because what you can do with knowledge is a benefit to society. Look at the pandemic. And what we need to have from universities is something that we thought maybe we didn't need to do anymore, which is reconstruct the belief in knowledge, the belief in education, the belief in science. This is, I think, the task for the future. And I will leave you with just one example of this. Just as we discover that we are capable of meeting the challenge of COVID-19, a pandemic that has shattered our institutions and our healthcare systems, we have at the same time a surge of people who just don't believe that vaccines, that science can actually solve these problems in our society. This is the challenge to help break the resistance of institutions that are resistant to change, to take sides in the face of our discussions of our future. This is the task of universities. And this is why I think that universities have a really bright future, but it will not be universities as we know them. It will be more committed, more connected, more involved universities on our common future. Such a, such a high responsibility for university leaders, uh, Xavier. 
Yeah, it's yeah. unfair. It, it, it's unfair. I know because when you look at, and I know you know this better than most, uh, Pastora. And if somebody, if a rector of a university is listening or a professor is listening, we say, look at this guy. How easy it is to say this, because universities today have so many constraints. They are asked to do ever more with ever less. They have bureaucratic ties, less and less money usually, and more responsibilities, as you say. Yes, this is true, but at the same time, there's no other way than fight against that. Because we know very well what universities need to do better. They need more autonomy. They need more money to fulfill their mission. But also they need to be more accountable against citizens on what they do. Yeah. In fact, as you mentioned, it's not uh, the difficulty here for university is not defining the agenda. So we, we do know what we have to do. Um, but to implement it, no? And in that sense, you, you were talking and in other meetings we were discussing about this platform of universities or collaboration between universities. So how do you envision that? Well, I think it is possible. I mean, I think we, are, we have so many examples of the importance, the need and the possibility of connecting institutions between them that the only obstacle is that tradition doesn't conduce to that. Because most universities are legitimately proud of what they do, of the degrees they deliver. And, you know, there is such a vertical tension in organizations that horizontal cooperation seems counter-natural. But it can be done. And actually, we see many examples of this already. We see many networks that are being created we just need to make sure that this becomes the core of the mission of universities and the way they see themselves in the future. This cannot be done by universities alone, but I think that there are many citizens and there are many institutions in our society who I think understand that we have to use knowledge better. And this is in the end, the only question that matters. And the only way to use knowledge better is to do it together and to do it in a more connected way. Yeah, yeah, it's true because now the, the generation of knowledge is not longer in the academia, not anymore, no? So it's, it's created in many other organizations such as hospitals, museums or, or city sure. halls, right? Um, Xavier, we have a couple of questions from the, from the audience. So let me just share them with you. Um, Jura Tapak, uh, uh, ask, um, if there's any European project or something similar uh, of, um, in order to, to go for a model of university with inter interdisciplinary studies or any intention to do that, to go for this interdisciplinarity or anti-disciplinarity you mentioned previously. Can well, you give us uh, Thank you. Those? Thank you. Well, I think I don't think that multilateral institutions like the European Union can or should tell universities how to behave. But I don't think they need to. I mean, look at this uh, famous you know, Bologna process of cooperation between universities. This started in the 1980s, but it started because some universities wanted to do it. And I think that this uh, practice of interdisciplinarity is already there, it's already being done by many academic institutions. The role of the European Union, I think, and I think it is what it's doing, and maybe it could do more, is to provide an incentive to this, to provide visibility to this, and to give it the, 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 uh, the, 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 the visibility and the distribution it needs, and to preach by example more than establish rules. I think that, I'll give you an example, the European Union has started a project to promote partnerships between universities beyond the opportunistic alliance for a project. This idea of the European University is a way to give a strong incentive to those institutions who want to create a complementary degree, to want to work together in an interdisciplinary way to do so. But the short answer is no, there is no legislation on that. There is, I think, a good case for this. Thank you, Xavier. Yeah, it's true. And, and yeah, we are seeing how uh, several European universities are moving in that in that direction. Um, Mar Maria Michaela Barbiero asks us, as you, 
uh, how do you think universities of the future can help young people to develop critical thinking, emotional and intercultural intelligence uh, in this and for this globalized and COVID context? What do you think, yeah. Xavier? Thank you. Thank you. I mean, of course, there's no simple answer to that. Otherwise, everybody would be doing it. But let me say the critical answer, the key answer to that question is the teacher, the professor. Because, you know, we are constantly saying how important all these things that you mentioned are. Critical thinking, empathy, uh, capacity for communication. Yes, of course, it's very important. But who is going to teach this? You need creative professors that have the liberty to do so, that have the incentive to be creative and to promote critical thinking. So I think that, you know, there is no education system, certainly no higher education system, whose quality is higher than the quality of its educators. So if there is one single recipe to make sure that universities teach what they should be teaching, is to make sure that we provide more means, more training, and actually also more access to the teaching professions. I think that there is a very clear evidence that those countries who are doing better, precisely in terms of creativity and in terms of the qualities of education in the 21st century, are those countries who care most about their teachers, the countries who do more for them, and the countries who give them the social prestige, who give them the accountability and the support that they deserve. And this is, I think, perhaps the one single most important point uh, to take forward. Yeah, how, Im how important are teachers, yeah, you're right, and professors. Um, we've talked about Europe and the different uh, yeah, dynamics we've had in Europe, but we have another question from Susanta Chodhari um, asking how can uh, third world countries uh, survive to this advance in technologies concerning higher education? Yeah, thanks, Susanna. This is a fantastic question because, you know, the risk of technology taking over education is a dramatic increase, increase in inequality. And as a matter of fact, the main international institutions dealing with education, for example, UNESCO, the World Bank, also the European Union, have alerted at this, you know, danger that with technology being increasingly important in education, those who don't have access to technology, those who don't have the means, will be left behind. This is a risk. Actually, it is what has happened with the pandemic. I mean, the pandemic has been, in the short term at least, the cause for an increase in inequality in education. It's very clear. Teach for All, the organization I work, we are in 59 countries in the five continents, and it's extremely visible the traumatic impact that technology can have in education. At the same time, the opposite can also be true. Because you can use technology, you don't need to repeat the same model of brick and mortar institutions to be built all over developing countries so that education can reach anybody. The extension of the number of people, the type of people that you can reach with relatively simple technology is really astounding. And you see many cases already of cooperation between universities of developed countries and developing countries that are a fantastic example of how you can bridge the gap of education inequality in a way that without technology would be completely impossible because it would require students or, or academics to actually move around the world. As a matter of fact, for, I mean, for a long time, the, one of the main challenges for higher education in developing countries has been the the, the, the brain drain of young, brilliant people who don't find a future in their country and live. This is the sort of things that, of course, technology can not provide miracles, but technology can be the instrument to reduce the digital divide. What this requires, I think, in the first place, as in so many of things, is just money. Uh, I, I think that, you know, perhaps the most striking factor, at least in my view, in North-South relations, in development cooperation, is the massive underinvestment in education compared to other sectors. And this is understandable. I mean, you want to help the children of a low-income country, 
you send them vaccines, it's easy, it's immediate, and the impact is positive and fantastic. You want to improve the education of these children, and it's much more difficult, it's much longer, and in many cases, donors simply uh, get, you know, get discouraged from the possibility of improvement. So the first answer to your question, I think, is simply invest more in the human capital of developing countries, and then use technology in a way that allows you to bridge the gap between poor and rich countries and individuals. Because this issue of inequality is not just between countries, it's also within countries and institutions where there is a massive divergence between access to a good education. Um, and perhaps I shouldn't forget in line what we said before, that one of the main challenges that we do not have in Europe, but we do have in most developing countries, is access of girls to education. In, in Europe, the problem is a different one. It's access of young women to scientific and technical education. It's the fact that once you get to a school, that doesn't mean that you learn interesting things, but access is not an issue. In most, in many developing countries, you still have a great burden on girls outside school that keeps them out of an education. And addressing that challenge also with technology is something that is within our reach and should be a priority of the international community. Yeah, Xavier. As, as you can see, Xavier is a uh, declared feminist. And um, we, we discuss a lot uh, concerning this, how to avoid and at least to reduce the gender, gender gap. Uh, in the different levels of, of education. Thank you, Xavier, for that. Um, Marianne Ridway, uh, she, uh, she has, we, we are moving now to knowledge and not that much to education and training. I mean. And she asks, what do universities need to do support knowledge being used well? Suppose she is asking for a properly use of this knowledge uh, generated and created at the universities. What do you think that universities need in that sense? Well, I'm not sure I understand the question. I think so. Let me let me say you know what would what would be the most important immediate change in universities? Well, I think that it boils down to reducing the boundaries between disciplines, because they're still extremely strong. I mean, it, I mean, interdisciplinarity is not something new. I mean, I'm not discovering in this, in this area here. And like so many other things, as Pastora was saying, the problem is not identifying what needs to be done. It's actually doing it. And all the inertia of university life is built vertically to increase the separation between disciplines. I mean, you, 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 if you just see how proud university departments are in extremely prestigious universities of having been able to have just a conversation between different departments. It's just amazing. So I think that the biggest effort that has to be made is that since we know so well the importance of looking at issues rather than looking from disciplines, I think that this is the single most important change. But then I think that there is also something else because, you know, most universities in continental Europe, for example, not for lack of you know, will, not for lack of capacity, but just because of the incentives they have, sometimes they have to behave more like bureaucracies than the learning institutions. Their incentives are not for the distribution of knowledge. For example, the funding of many universities, of most universities, of actually almost all public universities in Southern Europe, for example, depends exclusively or almost exclusively on the number of students that access university. Now, that is very good for access to university, but it's a very, very weak incentive to make sure that those people who get into university actually are there to learn the things that they will need in society. So I think that looking at universities to give them more freedom but also to give them more incentives to be accountable as to what happens once people have passed through the university, rather than just accumulating numbers. I think this is something maybe to look at. And it's not that, 
This is not happening. I don't want to give the impression that universities don't know or don't do a huge effort to modernize themselves. It just that it remains a big difficulty and a big obstacle uh, for in daily life of most higher education institutions, certainly mm -hmm. in continental Europe. And perhaps one last comment. We have spoken a lot about universities, but university is a very broad term. And we have and we will continue to have different types of universities that actually should differentiate more. That's another way to improve the way knowledge is created and distributed. In a way to caricature, sometimes you think that all universities want to be little Oxfords, generalist places that teach and research on almost everything. But well, that's not necessary. Maybe we can, not everybody needs or can be Oxford or Cambridge or, or Paris Sorbonne. We can maybe look at different specializations, different missions of universities. Some need proximity to people because being there is still important in many cases. Some maybe can specialize in a specific area of knowledge. So this is the sort of things that I think we will have to explore if we want to make sure that we extract from higher education institutions all they can give to society. Thank you, Xavier. Yeah, in fact, uh, concerning these different agents in higher education institutions, higher education systems, there's another question from Seliko Popovi um, asking if, our, if the universities are the only places where you can get uh, a certified diploma for the knowledge or the skills in higher levels. So you mentioned previously Coursera, but maybe can you develop a, a bit more on that, please? Well, that question would scare many people in universities because I think, as you were saying before, I think that universities are realizing that they have lost this monopoly on knowledge. And, and I think that to a great extent, it's also a legitimate concern because not anything could be or should be a university degree. And I think it's extremely important to think about the quality of an education, the quality of a degree. But what is happening today is that increasingly, there are more and more institutions and organizations, including universities, by the way, that rather than thinking about providing a Bachelor of Arts or a master's degree or a doctorate, are thinking in much more practical, modular way. So just ask yourself one simple question. If you want to work on I understand it's a simple case. If you want to work on computer science, would you rather have a degree from a mid-ranking university in your town or a certificate from Google? Well, most people would choose Google. I understand that this is not the same for computer science than for philosophy. But now you do have many actors that are coming into play. To a certain extent, is the response of what I said before about the massive demand for more education that cannot be met by traditional brick and mortar universities. If you have so many people wanting to get new skills, inevitably there will be a market for that. So there is a proliferation in many regions of the world, for example, Latin America, of new actors providing education at all levels. Not all of them with high quality, not all of them with sufficient quality, but there's a massive entrance of new actors. But then there is, I think, also, as a pastora was saying, there is many other types of institutions. For example, hospitals. Uh, so much knowledge can and should be extracted from the practice of a hospital that maybe one can think differently at the relationship between traditional higher education institutions and other sources of knowledge in today's world. The question, as always, is not going to be who provides information, but how do you ensure trust and quality in that information? And this is why I was saying that if I had to define with just one word, with one word, what would be the key for the future of universities, then what would be trust? If universities can provide trust in science, trust in the knowledge they deliver, they will have a future, no matter how many actors come into play. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the hardest thing is how to do it. And, and again, to the 
that I, you mentioned about collaboration and cooperation between the different universities. There's another question, uh, Tasha Tereshenko. One, what kind of improved cooperation between high, high, um, high education schools and universities do you envision, Xavier, and how cultures play a role in that? I, I lost you a bit. Can you repeat the last part of your question? Yes, yeah, sure. Sure. How, how do you see this improved co cooperation between universities or between the institution? And here, uh, how can teachers play a role as well? Not yeah. just institutions, so also a cooperation between teachers. Yeah. Well, the answer to the first question, I think, is pretty straightforward. I mean, few universities can claim excellence on everything. So the trick is a very simple one. Let's try to take a significant challenge of research. For example, cancer research in the field of healthcare. There are so many, so much scope for specialized cooperation between universities. And I'll give you an example that I know firsthand. Rare diseases. Uh, you know, you have some, di rare disease is a disease that affects a very small part of the population. And because of that, not one hospital, not one university, not one country can have the resources to uh, conduct the research that is necessary to address that. And yet you cannot leave all these people just without treatment. So what do you do? Well, we have in Europe something called the, U the European Network for Rare Diseases, which is a very simple idea. You take the best universities in Europe who are working, for example, on pediatric oncology, a major important specialization. And let's make sure that they bring together their efforts and that they produce joint work, joint research, joint treatments, and forget about whether the degrees are separate or where they come from. Most of the reasons why academic research cannot be shared are reasons that are bureaucratic and not scientific. So I think that the, the most important thing that can be done is to promote financially and otherwise to promote joint degrees, joint cooperation for a specific target and purpose. This is, I think, the way forward and the best incentive to promote cooperation between higher education institutions, to look at what they are best at doing and how they can complement each other for a single purpose and a single mission. Thank you very much, Xavier. And as we are running out of time, I think this last sentence, no, these last ideas you mentioned, are the, the best way to conclude this uh, conversation today. Thank you very much, Xavier, for giving us this past, present, and future of higher education institutions and, and systems. Um, and it is true that uh, we, we need radical changes and radical changes must come for universities to survive. So maybe why not uh, having a new edition fixing the universities. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Silvia. I give back to you. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. It's been a real pleasure and I hope this conversation was interesting and thanks to you, Pastora, for your patience. Thank you. It has been a pleasure, Xavier, as always. Yeah, thank you. Silvia, thank you very much. Thank you. the floor is yours. Thank you, Xavier. It's always such a pleasure to listen to you. And uh, thank you, Pastora, for leading this uh, interesting conversation. And thank you all for being with us and for your questions. We are done for today, but I hope to see you all next Thursday for the last session of Fixing the Future Education Edition. In this uh, last session, we are going to meet uh, uh, David Price and Liliana Arroyo uh, to extend with them the conversation about the future of education to the whole uh, education ecosystem and all the actors involved. So I see you there to fix the future.